Um, has any, there we go. Has any tech issues? <clears throat> All right, great. Hi, Carrie. We're glad you're here. Hey. Oh, that's a fun background. Is that UCF? It is. It's nice. one of their token ones you yes. can put in behind you. So it makes me nice. look like I'm yes. marching off. <laughs> hey, love it. Awesome. Good. It's been a long time since I've been on campus. I know we've just grown tremendously. We'll wait just two more minutes. I still see a lot of people coming in. Hi, Alexis. We're glad you're here. Oh, Jim, that's a fun one. <laughs> hey, Amber. Glad you could make it too. Annabelle. Good morning. Hi. Glad you could make it. Thank you. Cooler, Tara, Whitney, glad you guys are here. Hey, Shayla, we're so glad you're here. It was fun to see you at the Science Center yesterday. <coughs> I did my first and last first grade field trip yesterday to the science center. <laughs> Dana's going to do one uh, for foundation. Um, oh, fun. I think the days, my science center days are over. Oh. <laughs> so oh, gosh. All and right. Meeting him. Yeah. All right. Well, we are limited on time, so I'm going to I'll let people in as we um, as they come in. But I'd love to get started. Uh, we're so glad that you guys could join us. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to um, offer another lunch and learn. This will be our last one for the year, but we'll have some great things looking ahead for next year. Um, I'm going to open us up in prayer and introduce Jim, and we'll get started. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for um, the ability to bring in. Um, just wonderful speakers like Jim Lord to be able to come alongside us as we all are walking through this challenging uh, parenting journey. Just ask for your blessings in our time together as we um, just grow together and learn together. And um, thank you for this day in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, everyone, I am so excited to introduce you to Jim. This is Jim West. Jim is the president of Total Life Counseling Center, which has seven offices throughout South Florida and Central Florida and Texas. Uh, Jim's purpose is to help families and individuals experience the total life. Um, Jim has been an ad adolescent and family expert for ABC's Medical Minute, Fox News, Oprah Winfrey Network, other local TV networks, and various family and child and teen topics. Uh, total Life Counseling provides support to professional athlete organizations, families, couples, and individuals. Uh, he's the author of Stress Less series, which a nationally certified, he's also a nationally certified counselor, school consultant, professional communicator. He specializes in ADHD, Friends autism, would walk up. Oh, autism oh, bullying, okay. oppositional defiant disorder, and has also worked as a youth pastor while finishing uh, his master's degree in counseling at Liberty University and has incorporated youth ministry into his counseling approach. Uh, he's also a wonderful husband to a woman named Dana, who's a long time Why fan of about video games. Saying Sorry. And it's okay. And he is also uh, a doting dad to two adorable children. Oh, thank so, you. Jim, we are so glad that you're with us. And um, I'm going to 
make sure that the screen is yours. Let me okay. get that there and uh, take it away, Jim. Oh, and for everyone else, I will be um, monitoring the chat box and towards the end, we'll have a Q&A and anything and you're welcome to open up your mics at the end. And um, if you have any tech issues, we are recording. I'll follow up with everyone afterwards, um, but we'll, we'll leave it to Jim now. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for having having me and for the nice introduction and and uh, you know and for everybody that's on the call. I'm, I know you're on the call for the same reason. I mean, I have kids and I'm concerned about what what electronics are you know can are can do to my kids as well as you know before my kids um, my kids are seven and four and so I've already seen before I had kids what was going on and a lot of you have already sent, seen that as well and I'm seeing more and more parents having better boundaries with their kids with the electronics and being more educated and aware. And so let's just dig right in and, and, and look at what we're talking about. This is a two part talk. It's a video series on my website. Um, it's um, stress less with ADHD, stress less with anxiety, or sorry, alternative medication with defiance. There's all these different talks. So one of these talks is on addictions in the new millennium. And that's electronics is part of that and video games. And on the other side, we're not gonna talk about that today. But is the vaping and you know smoking pot and how they've made kids get addicted to pot and, and uh, nicotine. So we're just going to do the first half of this today, okay? So um, and that's of course electronics and video game addiction and social media. And then uh, I'm going to show you a news interview about video. Uh, do you want to see the one on video game addiction? Or want me to skip it? Do I miss skip that one, Alicia? Uh, sure. You sure? Yeah. No, I think that's pertinent to. All right. So this is a interview on video game addiction okay so let me just show you this it's it's really um concise just skip that part sorry it's a mental disorder video game for some reason, my audio is duplicated. Classified okay, as a mental disorder. The World Health Organization is adding gaming disorder to its international classification of diseases in 2018. Health officials say excessive gaming can lead to health problems. And here now with more on that is Jim West. He's the president of Total Life Counseling. Jim, good to see you. Hey, good to see you, Bob. Are, are you seeing this? Oh, yes, we have. We are. We are. Okay. We're seeing entire neighborhoods of where kids aren't going out to play. Yeah. They're inside playing their video games. Right. And talking to their friends, right, right. You I'm know? online. I'm with my friends. I'm right. Out. Um, it, it's an addiction. Does it manifest itself similarly to like an alcohol addiction or drug addiction or anything like that? Are the are the symptoms much vastly different? Very, very similar. It okay. rewires the it rewires the reward circuitry in the brain. So dopamine is released when our brain is rewarded. Mm -hmm. So it, re it releases that and it rewires the reward circuitry to the point where it's more rewarding to play video games than to go out with my friends or. To to have friends over or to go to school or in some cases go to work and for some people there's it's, it's a sense of validation too because within a video game you can be master of all you survey and you can be the hero and you can you can win so you get that kind of validation you can be much more than what you are in real life and some people find that more rewarding right? exactly if they don't like their life they can escape into this fantasy world okay so what does it mean when the world health organization classifies it as a disorder how does that change uh, treating it in 2018 and what you were able to do in 2017. Do you get access to more benefits or what? I think that's what's going to happen is now that it's, now that it's a diagnosis, this, then uh, addictions facilities can now, they've already been treating video game addiction, but now they can find it easier to get reimbursed by the insurance companies and cover it. How do you treat it? Well, very similar. It's counseling? It's counseling, but it's very similar to addictions of any kind. It's don't be hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And it's uh, changing people, places, things. You have to change your surroundings. We have to replace the behavior with something else, like okay. karate for kids, or, or or sports, or going outside to play. Mm -hmm. you, you you keep mentioning kids, but it's not just kids that are suffering through this. I, I know plenty of thirty and forty year olds that uh, you know have got Call of Duty on their phone or whatever. <laughs> well, there is. It's true. There's um, there's people getting divorced because of World of Warcraft and playing all weekend long. I mean. I, I know somebody who played a 50 year old man that played World of Warcraft for two weekends straight. And his wife said, it's me or the computer. And 
you know, he finally gave it up. Wow. And often people, unfortunately, I've, I've heard of that, it, and not just with gaming, but with other things. It's, it's either me or the pills, it's me or the alcohol. And Exactly. And some people choose the games. Is this a slow boil to this, or is it just something that we're seeing more? Because we didn't have video game addiction back in my day, because it cost you a quarter every time you had to play a game. You know? <laughs> I couldn't have yes. We had Pong, right? Remember Pong? You know, the little, I mean, you right. can only play so long and you right. get bored and you go out. Yeah. Ever since World of Warcraft, around 2001, they made the games addictive. Uh, even in social media, they make the like button to be like heroin. The guy's name is Justin from Facebook. He doesn't even have a, a, a smartphone anymore. You know, they, they, he, it's, it's so addictive. He had to get a flip phone because it was sucking him into okay. the guy that created it. Yeah. So the games are, are made, you rank up, you, get, you keep getting more more and more powerful right. and it just it's so alluring and it just right. they're, they're addictive when they weren't before yeah how do i go back to being joe schmo who's got to go to my my job at wherever yes I, well, I'm, the, I'm the king of the world over there exactly yeah. exactly jim how do people get in touch with you because i'm sure a lot of people are like hey hang on that's my kid or that's sure or that okay <clears throat> so it's pretty amazing um you know like a video game who would have thought that video game addiction would be something you know and, and of course, like when I, when we were all kids, most of us, when we were kids, the games were not addictive. You know, they just got harder and harder to play. And, you know, within about 15, 20 minutes, you, you just got bored and you'd go outside and play. Now they figured out ways to make this more and more addictive, you know, by ranking up and things of that nature. So I'm going to have to change this. Okay. So video game addiction, right? Okay. What is it? It's associated with depression and, you know, whenever we see it, it, you know, um, it's also the social media, the same thing for academic achievement, alcohol use problems. We, we're seeing conduct problems. We're seeing parents um, trying to take away devices and then the kids are getting into fights and physical altercations with their family, just as if, you know, you were taking away drugs, right? So we have, uh, this is the Definition according to the World Health Organization, it's gaming behavior characterized by impaired control over gaming, increased priority to given, given to gaming over other activities to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests and daily activities and continuation of escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. Now, this, <clears throat> this definition is the same definition if you were to change the word gaming to alcohol to drugs, you know, to, you know, whatever it is, or food, this is the same definition that they use. And they just actually plug the word gaming into the old addictions, you know, definition, okay? This is Dr. Um, Eric Sigmund, who basically talks about how games in a virtual world also lead to false competence and, you know, and children need to base their lives on reality. How, how many kids are out there saying, I'm gonna get sponsored, I'm gonna make a million dollars, I'm gonna make $3 million, you know? Um, and then, of course, I can get better hand-eye coordination, you know, from some studies, you know, sponsored by, you know, of course, these gaming companies. Fast use of gaming con console controllers, you know, you know, outside of the gaming environment really doesn't do, you know, much for them other than, you know, contribute to causing, a, like, attention problems and far, you know, which is a far greater loss. So they're, they're using up all their dopamine in their frontal lobe, their, pre their prefrontal lobe you know, to play video games. And then when it's time to do something less exciting like schoolwork and homework or chores, it's getting harder and harder to do. So we have kids that didn't have ADHD symptoms before playing video games that by playing them too much, you know, they, they, they get, um, they start to meet the criteria, right? And so sometimes when we put the boundaries, the right boundaries in place with those kids, it does get better. You know, like their brains can go back if it's not, been to, happening for too long of a period of time. In most cases, their brains can rewire. And I'll share that with you later. Um, so here you go, playing, um, this is that whole thing about dopamine being produced every single day. I was in the news interview, but this is, you know, this is Dr. Sigmund that's saying it. Um, in the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol, this is really surprising, okay? This is the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse suggested. Uh, that computer game play may lead to long-term changes in the reward circuitry of the brain that resembles the effects of what? Of drugs, right? Substance dependence. This is crazy that the drug and alcohol journal is talking about video games. Okay, here's another um, 
interview about Fortnite addiction. There's a warning parents about video games, saying they can be just as addictive as drugs. <laughs> A British researcher now even comparing it to heroin, saying some young players are going into rehab because of it. The researcher says she has double the number of kids in rehab for gaming compared to two years ago. Once you're hooked, she says it's hard to get unhooked. And joining us right now to talk about it is Jim West. He's with Total Life Counseling. Great to have you, Jim. Hi, Jim. Thanks, Thanks for coming back. Yes. back. Yes. I appreciate you. So this is disturbing, right? Because every parent struggles with this. The devices in the house, how yes. much is too much? What do you want people specifically to know about this particular game, Fortnite? Well, they're just getting better at making games more addictive. It really started way back with World of Warcraft. And you heard mm -hmm. about people getting divorced back then, about people playing for 36 hours straight over a weekend not, not sleeping and just playing and not moving and so then there was my, minecraft was addictive we called it minecraft you know like a play mm -hmm. on words but uh then we had uh we roadblocks can be addictive and then there's grand theft auto which is even banned in some countries and wow. now the you know there's overwatch and it's just what you know people are getting sponsored and if you want to be sponsored by the video game companies and you got to play it 100 hours a day exactly. right exactly and and then so the big deal about fortnite is you have to play a lot to be to beat one out of 100 it's like a it's called battle royale and you have 100 people you're playing against and, and to be number one, you've got to play for hours and hours and hours to be the best. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I did my son, my oldest son does play uh, Fortnite, and he said, Mom, come play it with me. And you know how you want to bond with your kid? Sure. It took me two minutes, and I was like, can't do it. Yeah. It wasn't for me. But I do right. find that he tended to play it so much, we took it out of his room. He, we took the whole console out of his room. Good for you. And guess yeah. what? Now he's doing other things yes. with his time. And I think sometimes it gets to that point because of the addictive nature of some of these games. Exactly. And really, it's you can be addicted to anything. For me, it's cheesecake. Okay? <laughs> right? right. Well, for me, it's chocolate. Pumpkin cheesecake. <laughs> so, okay. And we can all, and we have to find ways to have limits with things. But kids are different than us because we're adults. So we. And no, okay, if I've had too much chocolate, I know when I've had too much. If you've had too much cheesecake, mm -hmm. kids don't know when they've had too right. much Fortnite. Right, right. I mean, over Thanksgiving, a kid had eight slices of carrot cake, one of my clients, right? Oh, gosh. And so it's, and why? Because Thanksgiving, nobody's watching the cake. Yeah. Right? So it's just, so, but when they're watching, we limit things. And so it's the same thing with Fortnite. I've actually watched the client play this in my office, okay? And I we download it, let them watch it. It doesn't seem like a bad game. It's just how much they play. Mm -hmm. So the American Association of Pediatrics issued guidelines saying that if you're six to nine years old, you need to play outside for 150 minutes just to get 30 minutes of electronics time. Wow. And that accounts social media, that counts mm -hmm. YouTube, okay? And then when they're 10 to like 11 or 12, they get an hour with three hours of interaction outside. Jim, how do I know when it has crossed the line from normal to abnormal? Mm -hmm. Is there a barometer? You know what, we've got kids quitting teams, sports teams. We have, we have parents bribing their kids to go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, like their favorite steakhouse, mm -hmm. just to get them out of the house and, and, and hope that they'll go hang out with them. So, I mean, when it's like that, when they're not engaging in normal activities, that's when it's a big problem or when their grades are dropping at school. Yeah. And it's just like any addiction, even and like drugs. I mean, smoking pot, right. people don't want to leave. When they, they, they get so high, they get paranoid, they don't want to go out. They just, they, they, they uh, become like a hermit and they don't want to do just the normal things and interact with society. And I know we have to wrap, but I can't leave without asking you this. Why is it so addictive? I, I just, I guess I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Why is it so addictive? Why can't these kids just put it down and walk away. Right. Well, when you're playing video games, when you're eating cheesecake, when you're uh, doing drugs, if you're drinking alcohol, it releases dopamine, and uh -huh. that's the reward circuitry of the brain. And when the more they play it, it rewires the reward circuitry, and it tricks the brain into thinking the only way to be rewarded, in other words, the only way to have fun is to do this, not be with people, not go play outside. I actually tease some of the kids in my, our social skills groups because we work with autism and ADHD, and we tease them. I go, hey, there's a new game called Outside. <laughs> Want to go play? Yeah, you want to go play? <laughs> and you have virtual reality glasses. You, you can smell things. Yeah. Right, it's got all the senses. You can touch. You can touch yeah. it, right? You know? Cute. So. But the good news is you can unwire and yes, you, you can. can go back to normal. Yeah, we, we put those we limits have. in place right. and then the kids interact. They re rejoin their sports teams because right. they're bored. They're yeah. bored. I can say that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wait, I can't play my game anymore. I got to play soccer. Exactly. No, no. Yes. Like, yes. <clears throat> There's a warning. Parents a warning. about video parents games. About video saying they can be just as addictive There's as a drugs. <laughs> There's a warning.
There we go. Sorry about that. So, we, you know, this interview, you know, you can plug in social media, too much social media releases too much dopamine, you know, um, and, and just like uh, the video games and, and putting those limits, like I'd mentioned in place, you know, is important. And we'll talk about those limits at the end, you know, of the presentation. Um, you know, so this is just some stats here. You guys probably know a lot of this, right? So, um, but we have, you know, so why, what about smartphones, you know? Why are these a problem? You know, we're using them so much. We're taking them to the bathroom with us. If you read the book by The Big Disconnect by Catherine Adair, she's like, you know, you know, why are we taking, like, since when do we take bathroom or phones into the bathroom with us, right? I mean, we've got them with us all the time. We we leave without our phone somewhere and, we're, and we go back and we get it because it's like, oh my gosh, I, I got to have a phone. And, and I know part of that is for safety. It's nice to be able to call if you break down, if you need it, or if your kids want to get in touch with you. You know, um, you know, so, but it's just interesting how, how, you know, we're having parents try to get phones from kids and parents are, you know, having the, they feel they're, they're tackling their kids to grab their phone and getting into these, you know, domestic disputes oftentimes. Sometimes police are called as a result of how addictive the phones are. Okay. So these things lead to continual partial attention causes, you know, we know that, um, you know, traffic fatalities are actually going up now. They were going down for a long time and cars were getting safer. And now that we have people, uh, you know, distracted by their phones and having to respond to, to, to text, you know, I, I, the iPhone just had a new um, feature just downloaded. Uh, it just downloaded on our phones and it's asking me to set up focus, a focus setting for while I'm driving and then it will automatically send a message. I know like there's some apps that have been doing that, but now it's part of the, the operating system for the iPhone. So it is neat that more and more technologies, have, you know, is being done to, to try to make, you know, the devices safe and, and for us not to mess with our phones or try to prompt or, you know, respond to text while we're, you know, in a, you know, in the car. We, I think you guys know about the blue lights. A lot of the, a lot of the devices now have the dark screen and dark mode whenever it's dark outside and it switches to a dark mode. So we're not getting this bright light, you know, into our eyes, but you can see that's affecting our memory. It's harder to learn. It's causing some neurotoxins, depression, obesity. Um, uh, right, well, part of that obesity is just because we're on our phones a lot and we're not moving around as much. We're more sedentary. Retinal damage, cataracts and cancer, they're linking to that blue light. So make sure you put your phones in those dark modes if you're on them when it's a, you're in a dark room. Okay, this is an interesting, very interesting interview. Um, I don't have it, um, I have it, uh, I have to switch my screen over to this. Let me show you this. This is a TED Talk. So a few years ago, I heard an interesting rumor Apparently, the head of a large pet food company would go into the annual shareholders meeting with a can of dog food, and he would eat the can of dog food. And this was his way of convincing them that if it was good enough for him, it was good enough for their pets. This strategy is now known as dog fooding, and it's a common strategy in the business world. It doesn't mean everyone goes in and eats dog food, but business people will use their own products to demonstrate that they feel that they're confident in them. Now, this is a widespread practice, but I think what's really interesting is when you find exceptions to this rule, when you find cases of businesses or people in businesses who don't use their own products. Turns out there's one industry where this happens in a common way, in a pretty regular way, and that is the screen-based tech industry. So in 2010, Steve Jobs, when he was releasing the iPad, described the iPad as a device that was extraordinary, the best browsing experience you ever had way better than a laptop, way better than a smartphone. It's an incredible experience. Now, a couple of months later, he was approached by a journalist from the New York Times, and they had a long phone call. And at the end of the call, the journalist threw in a question that seemed like a, a sort of softball. He said to him, your kids must love the iPad. And there's an obvious answer to this, but what Jobs said really staggered the journalist. He was very surprised because he said, they haven't used it. We limit how much technology our kids use at home. Mm. This is a very common thing in the tech world. Uh, in fact, there's a school quite near Silicon Valley called the Waldorf School of the Peninsula, 
and they don't introduce screens until the eighth grade. Now, what's really interesting about the school is that 75% of the kids who go there have parents who are high-level Silicon Valley tech execs. Hmm. So when I heard about this, I, I thought it was interesting and surprising, and it, it pushed me to consider what screens were doing to me and to my family and the people I loved and to people at large. And so for the last five years, as a professor of business and psychology, I've been studying the effect of screens on our lives. And I want to start by just focusing on how much time they, they take from us. And then we can talk about what that time looks like. So I'm showing you here is the average 24-hour workday at three different points in history. 2007, 10 years ago, 2015, and then data that I collected actually only last week. And a lot of things haven't changed all that much. So we sleep roughly seven and a half to eight hours a day. Some people say that's declined slightly, but it hasn't changed much. We work eight and a half to nine hours a day. We engage in survival activities. These are things like eating and bathing and looking after kids, about three hours a day. And that leaves this white space. That's our personal time. That space is incredibly important to us. That's the space where we do things that make us individuals. That's where hobbies happen, where we have close relationships, where we really think about our lives, where we get creative, where we zoom back and try to work out whether our lives have been meaningful. And of course, we get some of that from work as well. But when people look back on their lives and they wonder what their lives have been like at the end of their lives, you look at the last things they say, they are talking about those moments that happen in that white personal space. So it's sacred. It's important to us. Now, what I'm going to do is show you how much of that space is taken up by screens across time. In 2007, this much. That was the year that Apple introduced the first iPhone. Eight years later, this much. Now, this much. That's how much time we spend of that free time in front of our screens. This yellow area, this thin sliver, is where the magic happens. That's where your humanity lives. And right now, it's in a very small box. So what do we do about this? Well, the first question is, what does that red space look like? Now, of course, screens are miraculous in a lot of ways. I live in New York. My, a lot of my family lives in Australia, and I have a one-year-old son. And the way I've been able to introduce them to him is with screens. I couldn't have done that 15 or 20 years ago in quite the same way. So there's a lot of good that comes from them. And one thing you can do is you can ask yourself what goes on during that time. How enriching are the apps that we're using? And some are enriching. If you stop people while they're using them and say, tell us, how do you feel right now? They say they feel pretty good about these apps, those that focus on relaxation, exercise, weather, reading, education, and health. They spend an average of nine minutes a day on each of these. These apps make them much less happy. About half the people, when you interrupt them and say, how do you feel, say they don't feel good about using them. Now, what's interesting about these dating, social networking, gaming, entertainment, news, web browsing, people spend 27 minutes a day on each of these. Hmm. We're spending three times longer on the apps that don't make us happy. That doesn't seem very wise. Now, one of the reasons we spend so much time on these apps that make us unhappy is they rob us of stopping cues. Stopping cues were everywhere in the 20th century. They were baked into everything we did. A stopping cue is basically a signal that it's time to move on, to do something new, to do something different. And think about newspapers. Eventually, you get to the end, you fold the newspaper away, you, you put it aside. The same with magazines, books, you get to the end of a chapter, prompts you to consider whether you want to continue. You watched a show on TV, eventually the show would end, and then you'd have a week until the next one came. So there were stopping cues everywhere. But the way we consume media today is such that there are no stopping cues. The news feed just rolls on, and everything's bottomless. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email, text messaging, the news. And when you do check all sorts of other sources, you can just keep going on and on and on. So we can get a cue about what to do from Western Europe, where they seem to have a, a number of pretty good ideas in the workplace. <laughs> Here's one example. This is a Dutch design firm. And what they've done is they've rigged the desks to the ceiling. And at 6 p.m. every day, it doesn't matter who you're emailing or what you're doing, the desks rise to the ceiling. <laughs> Four days a week, the space turns into a yoga studio. One day a week into a dance club. It's really up to you which ones you stick around for. But this is a great stopping rule because it means that at the end of the day, everything stops. There's no way to work. At uh, Daimler, the German car company, they've got another great strategy. When you go on vacation, Instead of saying this person's on vacation, they'll get back to you eventually. They say, this person's on vacation, so we've deleted your email. This person will never see the email you just sent. 
<laughs> you can email back in a couple of weeks or you can email someone else. And so, you can imagine what that's like. You go on vacation and you're actually on vacation. The people who work wow. at this company really feel cool. that they actually get a break from work. But of course, that doesn't tell us much about what we should do at home in our own lives. And so I want to make some suggestions. You know, it's easy to say between, say, 5 and 6 p.m., I'm going to not use my phone. The problem is 5 and 6 p.m. looks different on different days. I think a far better strategy is to say, I do certain things every day. There are certain occasions that happen every day, like eating dinner. Sometimes I'll be alone, sometimes with other people, sometimes in a restaurant, sometimes at home. But the rule that I've adopted is I will never use my phone at the table. It's far away, as far away as possible. Because we're really bad at resisting temptation, but when you have a stopping cue that every time dinner begins, my phone goes far away, you avoid temptation altogether. At first, it hurts. I had massive FOMO. <laughs> I struggled. But what happens is you get used to it. You, get, you overcome the withdrawal the same way you would from a drug. And what happens is life becomes more colorful, richer, more interesting. You have better conversations. You really connect with the people who are there with you. I think it's a fantastic strategy. And we know it works because when people do this, and I've tracked a whole lot of people who've tried this, it expands. <clears throat> they feel so good about it that they start doing it for the first hour of the day in the morning. They start putting their phones on airplane mode on the weekend. That way, your phone remains a camera, but it's no longer a phone. It's a really powerful idea, and we know people feel much better about their lives when they do this. Hmm. So what's the take home here? You know, screens are miraculous. I've already said that, and I feel that it's <coughs> true. But the way we use them is, is a lot like driving down a really fast, long road. And you're in a car where the accelerator is mashed to the floor. It's kind of hard to reach the brake pedal, and you, you've got a choice. You can either glide by past, say, the beautiful ocean scenes and take snaps out the window, and that's the easy thing to do. Or you can go out of your way to move the car to the side of the road to push that brake pedal, to get out, take off your shoes and socks, take a couple of steps onto the sand, feel what the sand feels like under your feet, walk to the ocean and let the ocean lap at your ankles. Your life will be richer and more meaningful because you breathe in that experience and because you've left your phone in the car. Thank you. Okay, another really cool video that really drives it home. And uh, it's neat. My wife has just started to put her phone, you know, on the counter when we sit down for dinner. And I was the one that suggested it. And now I've got it. This was another good reminder for me to do it. It's, they're so addictive, right? So, so anyway, um, <clears throat> let's continue here. The, the like button, why is it addictive, right? So the like button does give a short boost of social affirmation. When you go and you, go and you like it, and of course the person on the, on the other end gets a satisfaction, satisfaction from when they receive a like. And of course, when you post a picture, you're looking to see how many people like it. And then you wonder why don't they like it? And, and then, then there's all these like um, negative feelings and irrational thoughts and fears as to why maybe they didn't like something. Um, so it's the, these, um, the swiping down uh, on our phones is like, uh, like a slot machine. Like, uh, you know, it, it actually kind of gives you the uh, hypnotic effect to your eyes, you know, of a slot machine. So when that, that's happening, that's intentional, okay, well, that design, okay, to give us that feeling. Uh, and of course, the number one, the thing that makes the most money in casinos is uh, the slot machines, okay? I think it'd be it's like 70% of their revenue, okay? So it's designed, uh, designed to satisfy negative sensation associated with boredom. So when people get bored, they go grab their phone. Loneliness, frustration, confusion. Um, social media is linked to depression. In a study, and now I don't know if you realize that you guys remember this, but just um, just a few months ago, there was a whistleblower for Facebook and, um, and they were on the ropes and they said they knew the technology would make people more depressed, especially women with body image and eating disorders and cutting and and suicidal thought, all these different things they knew what was gonna happen, but they went ahead with the technology. And what's happened to Facebook as a result of that? You know, I don't know that there anything's gonna happen to them. I know their the Congress is talking about some regulations, but really haven't seen much. I guess I don't know if it's the war or the economy and the inflation that's everybody's you know more focused on right now. Um, increased suicidal um, suicide parallels to increase in social media. 
Um, you know, with cyberbullying, I believe school shootings have gone up over 600% since um, social media and cyberbullying has been going on. That's another talk that I do. Um, but uh, people who spend more time on social media had significantly greater odds of depression compared to spending less time on social media. And of course that backs up the TED talk, right? Social media declines subjective mood. So people who are feeling sad or, or down and they, they feel this impulse to grab their phone to feel better, they don't actually feel better when they do it. So why do we do it? It's all been built in, okay? So, um, you know, to the making it addictive and, and causing that impulse. Peers on social media elicit feelings of envy and distorted belief that others' lives, you know, others um, lead happier lives or more successful lives. Why? Because people post, you know, the brushed photos of themselves or filtered pictures of themselves, you know, uh, pictures of themselves that are flattering or, you know, or them having a vacation or just, you know, not that, not that many people post negative things on Facebook. And if they do, people, you know, will kind of scan by it. Okay. Increased social media um, sometimes causes, of course, cyberbullying, which also will and can increase feelings of depression. Um, of course, the most the, the most at risk population, um, you know, for suicide is 10 to 14 year old females. So another reason to try to keep them off social media. Okay. So from 2000 to 2017, rates of suicide from social media have spiked 47% for ages 15 to 19, more than 6,200 suicides among people um, 15 to 24. It's really sad. I mean, and that's, and it's gone up even more with the pandemic and that social isolation. Of course, what was everybody doing during the pandemic? They were on their phones and on electronics and internets and playing too many video games. Of course, getting addicted to alcohol and drugs as well. Um, social media distracts us from face-to-face -face interactions that could be detrimental to mental health. I mean, when people were socially isolated in those states that weren't open during um, COVID, I mean, oh my goodness. I mean, crime went up, homicide went up. There, I mean, people were going crazy. I mean, we were isolated somewhat for about six weeks and me and my wife were already going crazy. And, you know, so what do you, I mean, like, I can't imagine what it was like for people in states that weren't able to get away, you know, weren't able to, you know, that were locked down, okay? It can also facilitate bullying, which leads to more anxiety and depression as well, and leading to ultimately suicide thoughts. Here's the guy I mentioned in the first news interview. This is Justin Rosenstein. He, um, you know, Silicon Valley, there's an article in The Guardian. If you go onto The Guardian, you can look this article up and it basically says that, you know, professionals are disconnecting themselves from the technology they made addictive, okay? And so they're getting addicted to their own technology, okay? So, and so they're finding, they're trying to find ways to disconnect. And so, um, you know, they're not meeting their deadlines, you know, like he's a consultant to Google and Twitter and Facebook, and he's not meeting his deadlines because he's, you know, getting on his phone and he's tapping and scrolling. And so Justin Rosenstein, one of the creators of the like button, had his assistant put parental controls on his iPhone to prevent him from downloading apps. And then he went on 60 Minutes um, a few months later and said he has a flip phone now because you know, he hacked the phone, he hacked the parental controls, okay? I mean, he's a hacker, he's a computer developer, right? So he's also banned himself from Snapchat, which he compares to heroin. Now think about that. I mean, the most addictive substance he could think of was heroin. He said, I'm off of it. He's an adult and he's not on it because of how, how addictive it is and distracting it is. Um, of course, we already know too. I mean, one of the biggest reasons kids are getting kicked out of schools now is Snapchat. And one of my good friends is an attorney for the schools and defending the schools when their kids are getting, you know, when students are being kicked out and the parents are getting upset and trying to sue the school, um, you know, for, for using, because of misusing Snapchat. Um, so, um, he, so, uh, he hired, um, Leah Perlman to handle his social media, to monitor it. I actually have somebody that does our social media for us. So I don't have to be on it all the time because, because people are addicted to it, to, to market our practice, we are on social media, you know, and we are posting really good information and articles. And if you want to follow us, go for it. But the thing is, is that if I were to be on there doing that myself, then I would. I would get way too distracted.
way too distracted. So, <clears throat> um, Hooked, here's a book you can buy on Amazon right now on how to build habit forming products. This is how, in other words, you can learn how they hooked, hooked us, right? Isn't that crazy? One of my clients brought his son, who was maybe five or six, who was addicted to technology. And I showed him the cover of this book and he goes, oh yeah, I've got that book. I've read that and many other books just like it on how to make technology addictive. And now he's coming in to help me get his son off of the technology, okay? So how about this? The technologies we have, this is his quote from the book, the technologies we've used, uh, we have turned into compulsions, if not full-fledged addictions. You know, Eyal is the author, writes, it's the impulse to check a message notification. It's the pull to visit YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter for just a few minutes, only to find yourself still tapping and scrolling an hour later. Isn't that something? Look at this last quote. None of this is an accident, he writes. It's just as their designers intended. Of course, a lot of you may have watched um, The Social Dilemma with, on Netflix. You, you know, And these guys are on there. These technology guys are on there with tremendous remorse about what this has done to you know, the, the next generation, you know, our kids, you know, the next generation, us too, right? So, so what do we do about it, right? So how do we set boundaries for our children? And, you know, technology is an incredible tool that can be used to enhance our experience, but, you know, and connect us to others, but we, we must treat it with respect it deserves, just like we put limits on food. Check this out. Um, this is, and this was done in uh, 2014. Since then, uh, in the middle, uh, you'll see number, for the 17-year-old age restriction, you see Tinder and you see Vine, okay? Now, I don't think that Tinder, a 17-year-old should be on Tinder. I, I think you guys would agree. Um, Vine uh, is now TikTok, and they thought that you should be 17 to be on their platform. This is the age restrictions they put on themselves. YouTube, 18 years old is what they said. Back in, in 14. The stuff on YouTube now is way more sexual, way more pornographic and, you know, um, uh, provocative and with links to pornographic websites. OK, so um, they've also um, if you're people that are into like reducing sex trafficking, say that Facebook and Twitter, Etsy, you know, um, what's the other one? Um, uh, Instagram are big, uh, the, the biggest you know, of the dirty dozen. There's a dirty dozen list for sex trafficking. You can go look it up. And they're one of the big ones out there because, you know, they allow all these pictures of girls that are underage that are very provocative with links to porn sites of them and they're being pimped out online. So anyway, so YouTube says 18 years old, guy, ladies and gentlemen, this is crazy, right? And why are we letting our kids on YouTube? And then it says 13 with the parent's permission. So it's interesting. Twitter says, okay, in Facebook, even Facebook says your kids should not be on there under 13 years old. Okay. So we need to really think about that. If these guys are saying 13 years old, by the way, Tumblr and Reddit should be 18 because there's pornography. People on Tumblr are putting, they're calling it art, but they're putting naked pictures of men and women on their uh, on their platform and it's fine it's acceptable to tumblr and reddit as well so you know be careful and of course snapchat you know if you look on um, mediamatters.com you can look at some um, and also if you go to um uh, uh net nanny they have like pages on like what they recommend are the right ages for kids to be on some of these platforms and they say six, snapchat you should be over 16 the attorney for Lake Highland, Park Maitland, um, I think First Academy. I don't know if they're your, she's your attorney, but she was my next door neighbor for many years. She says, Snapchat, the kids should not, they have to be very mature and very responsible to have Snapchat in high school, not middle school at all, but not even high school. She doesn't recommend it, but, you know, and she said her daughter, she gave it to her, I think when she was 17. Okay, she allowed her to have it because she had learned. And, you know, this attorney goes, comes home and talks about these cases and all how all these girls have been exploited by sending pictures, you know, in social media. 
uh, you know, to boys thinking they're not going to share it to anybody else. And the research shows that every boy will show the picture to someone. And as soon as that's shared, now it's distributing child pornography. And then when kids are kicked out, boys are kicked out and they come to see me and they're like, we're going to get an attorney. We're going to fight this. And one of my clients went and got a very big, high powered attorney. And if I can't tell you the name of it, but if I told you the name, you'd be like, oh my gosh. And that attorney got somebody off of killing someone, their child with, you know, and, and this, that attorney could not even help my client. So they said, look, if we go to court, they're going to expose this, that you did child pornography. They have proof you have it on your phone or you had it on your phone. They have screenshots of it and you will, your child will go to jail for have, distributing child pornography. So guys, Snapchat is really, really bad. Okay. I can't say it enough. Okay. TikTok was Vine. Um, it is, I'm sorry. Yeah. TikTok was Vine and they said 17. So kids should not be on TikTok at all. All right. Not to even make these cute little videos. Cause that's, I mean, obviously that's how it started. And it's very addictive. In fact, YouTube is losing a lot of traction right now to TikTok because the videos are short, concise, just quick. And then every video is really quick and they just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and seeing another video, another video, another video. And they're very sexual as well. If you're not careful with those videos. Here's the big disconnect that um, I referenced earlier. On the news interview where I talked about like how much is too much based on their age, I referenced the American Academy of Pediatrics. I actually, I misquoted. It was actually Dr. Catherine Adair who gave those um, guidelines. You know, she basically says kids up to, you know, two should not be on any electronics at all. You know, they need to face, they need lots of face-to-face -face interaction. They need tons of social, tons of social. Almost every waking hour, they need lots of interaction from us to learn how to read facial expressions, to have good eye contact, to, art, you know, to listen to words, to articulate words and sounds and and what do words mean? And we need, they, we, they need that. So baby Einstein actually in some countries has been banned in France, it's been banned um, because anything aimed at kids under three, they, they said they, they know it's not good for them, okay? Ages three to five, you know, basically, you know, we don't talk about it that much, but ages three to five, you know, if you're gonna be, do something like an educational game with them on an iPad for 15 or 20 minutes, and you're sitting next to them, they say, you know, she says, that's okay. When you hand them an app, like a video game, or you, uh, you know, hand them a, um, your phone to distract them, you know, and you give them an app to play, it's very stimulating, okay? It's, um, it releases so much dopamine. This is, you know, in fact, um, I was getting my iPhone replaced or fixed. And when I was doing that, my, my son was four and he was on a little, a little iPad playing little, you know, games and stuff. And then when I had to take him off of it, he had a meltdown. He had a meltdown. My daughter, the first time she had a phone in her hand was at two and a half when um, the, um, my, um, oh, what was it? Uh, somebody was giving me a bid, a construction person was giving me a bid and they handed her a phone and then she put, Googled puppies. And my daughter went like this. And every time she did, she goes, oh, <gasps> You know, like she was getting this big endorphin release and dopamine, right? And then as soon as we took it away from her, just looking at puppy pictures, just pictures, not even an app, taking away the, the phone, she had a meltdown for about 30 minutes from the loss of the dopamine. So we used to let her watch Paw Patrol on the, on the TV. And then my wife wanted to like use like a, like a workout video on the TV. And so she would let her watch it on the iPad, the same power Paw Patrol for 20 minutes, 20, 30 minute episode. She would watch it on there and she would take it away and she would have a meltdown. If we turned off the TV, if she was watching it, she was fine. So it's, there's something that um, Steve Jobs knows about the, just having it in your hand, how it re that releases dopamine and the, the, the picture and, and the colors. And it's just so um, it's stimulating, you know, so that these are all things we just need to be aware of, right? So how much is too much? So I did give you guys a handout in the packets if um, uh, Alyssa has it already sent it to you. Um, but um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends children under two, you know, uh, you know, not be on any electronic activity or TV because their brains are rapidly developing. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics said 
you know, and watch out for the media and both foreground and background. So for those of you that maybe still, I used to do this, turn on the TV, like the news and walk into the other room when you, when you wake up, that's not good for a baby because now they're, they can't hear you interacting or talking and they're listening to how you interact and talk. They're hearing the TV and you, and, and they're not, you know, it's really hard for them to multitask. Their brains don't multitask very well. Okay, Taiwanese, Taiwan parents are illegally bound to monitor their kids' social media, uh, their screen time under the age of 18, or they are fined. So if you're at a restaurant in uh, Taiwan and you're on your phones, your kids are on their phones, you'll get a ticket. Okay, so here's the guidelines, which are, okay, six years old to nine or 10 years old, they say 30 minutes of electronics with 100, if they socialize 150 minutes. This is how Dr. Catherine Adair talks about how you rewire the reward circuitry and you get them to not be addicted to it and to have, get excited about being with people, be excited about, let's go play outside. Yeah, let's go, you know, being excited again to do some of these things because we have kids that are not excited to go do things. I had a, one of my good buddies, his son just wants to be, I have two, good friends that their friends, their kids, they, they're on a, one of them's on a lake and they got a boat and the kid doesn't want to be out on the boat. He wants to be inside playing video games. And another kid, same thing. He doesn't want to be out tinkering with his dad's car and doing modifications and doing, you know, guy stuff. So 11 to 12 years old, or, you know, more like 10 to 12 years old, it's like three minutes. Um, you know, if they play for three minutes with non-electronics play, like having dinner conversations, uh, playing P and PE, we can count lunch, conversation. We can count talk, conversation in the car, going outside to play, riding your bike, playing sports, you know, karate, uh, you know, gymnastics, whatever, whatever, you know, they can do, they can count all of that as social interaction because they need lots of that. They're still learning about relationships and connecting and talking to people. And then of course you have 13 to 15 year olds. It's one and a half hours of social interaction to get, um, uh, to get that, um, uh, to get, th I'm sorry, three hours of socializing to get one and a half hours of screen time. Okay, so, so double, so now the ratio is, you know, two times the amount of socialization to get, you know, one, you know, one, uh, you know, one minute of electronics. 16, 16 years and all up, they say one minute for one minute for up to two hours of uh, screen time a day. Okay, so here's some other things that, Dr. Adair and other psychologists recommend no electronics or TVs in their bedrooms. Make electronic free zones in your home, dining room. You know, it could be, you know, but make the um, dining room could be, you know, when we're playing a board game with the family, you know, everybody puts their phones away. Okay. No dinner, no TV dinners or electronics during dinner or uh, explain to children the health benefits, like help them understand. You guys can share this interview if you want. You can share. Um, I also have this professionally produced on video on our website, on our totallifecounseling.com. You guys can download it there and you can watch it and you can go over it with them. You can watch Social Dilemma with them on Netflix, okay? So um, they need to be educated. So you don't just go, okay, guys, we're gonna put these principal controls in place. They need to understand the benefits so that when they're out of your home, they'll continue to practice that, okay? They, parents need to model face-to-face -face interactions with their kids instead of having your phone here and you're talking to your kids and you're doing this and you're going back and forth like this, or you're looking at them with one eye and looking at your device, they really need to model that. So when my kids come into the bedroom to wake me up, I hear them coming and my phone is face down when they come in the room so that they see my face. And my wife does the same thing. And they see us and we smile and we look at them eye to eye and we, we be, good morning and I love you. It's good to see you. Give me a hug, you know? And so we're doing that kind of stuff in the morning where they don't, you know, remove background noise. Don't keep the TVs on the background. Multitasking is for adults. I would like to say multitasking is for women. <laughs> I don't multitask very well. Um, so uh, multitasking is for adults, not children. Deep concentration um, in kids will lead to better, more creative thinkers. And I am so thankful for how creative my kids are when they're playing independently, when they don't have the you know, we don't have the TVs on uh, during the week. They watch like a 20 minute episode while they're having dinner, while we're, we're cooking dinner for them uh, in the mornings on Saturday and Sunday to let us sleep in. We let them watch some TV. Other than that, we are playing together. We're playing 
board games or cards or outside or you know feeding the fish or whatever we're doing we're, we're you know we're getting out there and my daughter is so creative and my son is so t- as well you know and they'll even get like old halloween costumes and put them on and they'll they'll engage in a lot of like like interactive like creative play and that's you know we know that kids that are on screens too much the screens think for them and it doesn't stimulate that much okay take a gap between screen time so some people will say an hour like things should be turned off an hour before they go to bed um, you know, some people say 30 minutes and you just kind of play around with that. Being overstimulated is worse than being bored. Okay. You know, I'm bored. Well, go play with your brother. Go, you know, why don't you go place, uh, you know, go play outside or go ride your bike or right. So, you know, so learning to cope and oh, by the way, in the book, there was a great quote by Dr. Catherine Adair. She said, being bored is the precursor to creativity. Think about that. It's really good soundbite. Learning to cope with being bored leads to greater self-sufficiency as well. Screen time is usually sedentary. So getting your child up and moving is far healthier, right? Social activity. Don't fool yourself in thinking that being on Facebook or talking online while video gaming is social. A lot of kids will tell you, well, I'm talking to my friends. Well, I understand that could be, that is part of socializing with friends today. I'm not saying it's not social. That is if they're playing with people that they have in their school or in their neighborhood or people that they know at church, you know, but if they're playing with strangers online, those are not friends. And we don't even know if those people online are who they really say they are too, okay? Nonverbal communication is 80% of communication and which is missed with social media and online gaming. So we don't want kids texting when there's a problem. We want them to call their friends if there's a problem. We don't want them trying to figure out a problem online with social media. We don't want them airing out their problems online. We need to start teaching kids about privacy, okay? We don't want them putting family problems online either, okay? So hobbies, arts, crafts, fishing, these are things that count for socializing, right? Legos and kiting and and museums and photograph photography and music and you know and you can kind of throw in your own stuff there okay here are some apps if you're concerned about um, cyberbullying bark has been around a long time and monitors around 25 like different um, social media sites um, I believe there's kind of a loophole with with Snapchat I don't know if any of those developers have figured that out yet but it is really hard to monitor Snapchat that's why you just don't want them on it and they're like well I can't talk to my friends. They can message them on Instagram if you let them have Instagram. They can text them uh, as well. Um, so I would put off any social media with kids all the way through middle school if you can hold them off. Okay. We Zift, out of all of these apps, We Zift is probably the best one I found. And it also, I think, helps with cyberbullying too. So you might not have to have Bark and We Zift. And it actually works with all devices except for like Xbox and PlayStation and um switch but those those new um gaming systems have parental controls on them as well where you can schedule how much they can be on those devices okay um here are for xboxes or consoles that aren't don't have parent controls this is a good timer you can get on amazon bob the timer and the plug plugs in it locks into the back of it and they punch their code in and they get their allotted time based upon their age you know, that, you know, once they've done their chores, you know, you, you can go in and give them their time. You can just punch a button and then it turns off when it's, when it's, when their time is done. Okay. 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 Actually. All right. I'm going to go ahead and open it up, I guess, for questions. I know we only have a few minutes, right? That was a lot packed in there, Jim. I'm <laughs> okay. There's, I read the book that uh, you had recommended and I know I personally uh, you know, had a little reflection time about where I can make improvements and uh, the, you know, challenges in our own family. Um, any questions that you guys want to type in in the chat or um, open up your microphones um, and ask on anything related to the topics today? Hello, this is Angela Jennings. Hey, Angela. Hi, Angela. So I first want to say thank you. I realize I'm addicted to my phone. (laughs) And as an adult, I've used it more for replacing the newspaper, magazines, or researching. So for me, when my kids are home in the evening, I'm on my phone. And to me, I'm learning because I didn't grow up with all of this. 
Right. So it's making me aware that even though I'm doing responsible things and it's quality content, I'm not giving them the right impression. I still have a phone in my hand. Or if my kids find a phone in another room, they're always giving it to me. That's another flag. <laughs> so my question is um, regarding the television. So, you know, we still try to watch movies together. I have uh, Monday movie night with mama. That's where we go into the room and we watch a movie together on like Disney or, you know, the kids Netflix with the television. Do you have, cause we mostly talked about video games and actually screen time, but what are your thoughts on television? Is it that severe? Cause that was severe when I was young, that was a big no, no. And I think it's kind of changed. So, you know, uh, I think when, again, with kids, uh, when, when she said was kids under two, under three, I believe she said not, no TV. Okay. Um, it's too overstimulating. Um, but kids, you know, that are, that are you know, like when they're three to five watching with them, something educational, like, and of course movies is, is one thing, but like the, what's addictive is how Netflix continues. It doesn't have a stopping point. Um, Disney Plus, I think, has a stopping point. I think you can program it to do it. Netflix, you can't. Um, I think some of these other, um, is it Am um, Amazon Prime? There's not a stopping point. You know, you can keep going and you can keep binge watching. You, you know, we used to have to wait for the episode next, you know, Friends or The Office. We had to wait next week to watch it. Now we can binge it. So the guy that runs Netflix um, says, the CEO says, I'm not competing with anybody, at least at that time. Now he's got a lot of competitors. But when he did this quote, he didn't have a lot of competitors. He was the top streaming company. And they, he said, I'm, I'm competing for your sleep. I'm competing for your sleep hours. Isn't that something? It's pretty bold. Awful. So just kind of looking at like how much they're watching. We don't, we don't let them do Netflix kids either. We found some problems with some of the programs on there, like My Little Pony, you know, it seems innocent, but it's really teaching girls to be very catty, very like gossipy and talking bad about each other. And insulting each other, and um, so you know we don't do the Netflix um, kids. Um, we do have Disney Plus; they're watching some things and on there, but we don't let them watch um, Star Wars. My son got too aggressive watching that, so we pulled him off of Star Wars, even though he loves wearing Kylo Ren's outfit to Hollywood Studios. You know, <laughs> gets us into some rides <laughs> that way because <laughs> he's the supreme, whatever emperor, whatever it is. But um, but um, yeah, so we're, you know, we, um, we don't want them to watch YouTube. I'm trying to think of what else we, what else we let them watch. It's, um, um, oh, I can't remember what it is, but there's certain shows. But that's like a good point. The, the stopping, cause I'm actually annoyed with Disney that I have to go back in the room for the three-year-old and click next, <laughs> but yep. you're putting in a very, very good perspective. Like there needs to be an end to something. There needs to be a you know, um, uh, a pause and then move on to something, like you said, more creative. So, right. So, thank also, you. You know, right. And thank you, Angela. And then we do, I'm sorry, we actually do Netflix kids, but we monitor what they watch and we tell them what they can and can't watch. And they, so far they're listening with us right now. That's, that's right. So we did, we are letting them do that, but we're, we're in the room, you know, you know, while we're watching, while they're watching that, or we're listening because the TV is right by our bedroom. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Alisa, hi. I know we're over time. Is it okay if I have one more question? I, fine. I got a few minutes. I, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is Annabelle. So, hi, Annabelle. Uh, hi. I wanted to share uh, something that happened recently. Um, we had one of my friend's uh, neighbors knock on our door with... Um, it's a video game. It's, it's It looks like a tablet, but it's a video game. And she said... Uh, Mrs. Blanner, I want to give this to you. I think, you know, Valentin is the only kid in the neighborhood that doesn't have a device. And so we feel bad that you're struggling financially. We really oh. want to give you this device. <laughs> and, I, and I said, oh, thank you. And I closed the door and it took me a while to realize what had just happened. Uh, right. Being the only child in the neighborhood that does not have a phone, a tablet. We are very strict with the usage of those things. I mean, we don't have, he doesn't have anything. However, we struggle when we go to friends' houses. We struggle when we go to family homes. Every single kid has a device. So we will go to a party 
a pool party and one of the kids will grab the tablet and hear all of the kids go behind him. So what do you suggest in those circumstances where we're working so hard to make sure that our son is not exposed to that, that he's not using technology, but then when we are in social situations, it's unavoidable. It's a good mm -hmm. question. That's a great question, Annabelle. You know, we do hear this all the time. And so the reason we're like, when we're on a call like this, we have a lot of parents that are trying to align, you know, if you guys align your values and everybody's like doing the same thing, then in your circle, in your world, you're able to control that. And so, you know, we've got a, like a Bible study of moms in my neighborhood and we're educating each other and we're trying to align and trying to get everybody, you know, um, on the same page with us. And, and, and so, you know, when you go talk to your moms and I, I'm going to tell you, moms and dads are going to say, I am frustrated. You know, I can't believe how much they're on this. They don't want to go out to play. They don't want to go play sports. They're quitting their teams. Like I've got parents not realize that their kids were playing six hours a day and they quit a swim team at a very prestigious school quit, you know, and then within two weeks, we put these boundaries in place and he went back to playing the sport on his own. He, he, and I go, why? He goes, just like the news interview, because I am bored. So when it comes to electronics, when, if you follow the guidelines, like if you say, okay, you're six to nine years old, so you can have 30 minutes on this and that's it. You know, you can play video games for 30 minutes. If it's an approved video game, we don't recommend Grand Theft Auto. Like it's been banned in other countries. Why we don't ban it in the United States, I don't know, but it's banned. It's horrible. It's got a strip club in it. You can get a lap dance with a topless girl in, the, in that game. Okay, you have to like kill people. You have to be a narcissist and kill people to, to uh, make money. You run over a prostitute, you earn money. And you, the more money you get, you can buy a car. So like, you gotta be really careful. Oh, well, I just wanna drive around. Well, there's other games you can drive around in like Horizon, Forza Horizon is a game you can drive around in and you can just kind of, you don't have to run over people to earn points. You earn money by, by winning races instead of killing prostitutes and killing drug dealers and delivering their drugs to get their fees. I mean, it's horrible, Grant. I mean, the games that we're allowing our kids and no wonder school shootings are up too. I mean, cause I mean, these, a lot of the shooting games has desensitized these kids and I'm not opposed to shooting games. I'm just saying that some kids, especially if they're angry kids or they're victims of bullying, you wanna be careful with them playing these games because that's what makes these, the kids that are doing school shootings are socially awkward white kids males white males are the kids that are doing these school shootings okay it's not gang members it's not you know it, it so anyway all that to say you you know just have have some balance i have an xbox in my office i have a seven foot screen and surround sound and i have age appropriate games for each you know age group and i play with some of my clients you know um if they're not addicted to it you know i'll play with them a little bit but but, um, but you, you know, you, it wouldn't be a bad thing for them maybe to have some electronics. And when it comes to like a phone, I'm going to wait for on a smartphone. They can have a flip phone, maybe up through middle school. Then when they get to high school, we might let them have a smartphone. But boy, we're going to take it pretty quick if they, you know, if they're not going to, if they try to get around the parental controls or they're trying to download apps without our permission. Again, if you set up the parental controls properly, they won't be able to do that. I have a question. Um, this is Angela Clark, uh, and mine is uh, similar to the to the previous parent. Um, what it what I'm wondering is, you know, my older daughter is at an age where sleepovers are very common. Um, you know, people coming over, and sometimes when friends come over, they bring their electronic devices. I'm wondering if you have advice on how to delicately find out from the parent where they're staying or make it known that you would prefer for your child to not be on electronics without being rude because um, my daughter has been introduced to, you know, TikTok and Snapchat and things like that at really great friends' houses. And I would prefer for it, or, or even, you know, they'll come over to our house for a sleepover with their device. And it's just such an awkward thing to, you know, tell another kid. So is there a way to maybe a, like, navigate that yeah it's pretty much it's a very similar you know question we hear a lot and that's where i tell parents here's the handout boundaries of electronics make copies have have coffee together have a glass of wine talk together with parents and and ask them you know what are they seeing and you know what are you concerned about and 
and and just kind of see where they're at with all that. And sometimes it leads to it leads to them saying, you know, yeah, I am disgusted with TikTok, or or I think she spends way too much time on it, or her grades are dropping because of it. And you know, so you just start to have that conversation, or say, hey, have you seen the social dilemma? You know, and and then when they, because I mean, you look at that, and you go, oh my god, like cutting went up 130 something percent, and and body image issues, and mental health issues, all these things like got worse, and your kids are getting depressed on it. Or hey, I heard a news interview about this, or I just heard this talk you know, on, you know, on the effects of electronics and social media on kids. What are you hearing? You know, what are you, are, does this bother you? Are you concerned? You know, just kind of start having those conversations, you know, so that you can start to maybe have that influence over them. And if not, just then if, if that doesn't work, then just say, hey, you know, I, when my kids come over, like I've, they, they're already going to have their allotted electronics time. So when they come over, is it okay if the kids go out and play or go swim in the pool or, watch a movie is that you know is that okay you know if they can do that anybody else jim we had a question about um educational games for uh five to seven year olds and i know um for us we do like to look at the common sense media um website that we've ha had success with you know, yes. discerning definitely with movies and TV shows. Oh yes, uh, Common Sense. That's the one I was trying to think of. Yeah, That's the Common one Sense Media is a great website. In awesome. fact, our um, our librarian has sort of uh, taken courses and is using some of those resources with um, our okay. students in the library time. But we found that that website does make really good, um, like what I think are very age appropriate um, direction or advice to parents on at least letting you know what you're getting yourself into. So when it comes to educational games, just make sure you're balancing out, um, you know, having that social interaction, you know, for five to seven years old or six and seven year olds, they say, you know, like 30 minutes, you know, like they need a hundred, let's say, let's focus on like, they need 150 minutes of socializing and interacting and face-to-face -face interaction. And they learn, there's a Penn State studies thing that boys learn how to socialize by their dads watching their dads interact with their friends with their guy friends so making sure you're bringing your kids around other appropriate you know parents so they can see Some how models. you interact so they can right and and so you know making sure they're getting that um before you you know uh, do the educational games would be you know my suggestion if it's a rainy day you know i understand and and i know we've played life on on the uh, ipad but we prefer playing it on an actual, you know, board, you know, and Monopoly, instead of, we have it on the app, but instead of playing it there, we would prefer, because it's just so, like, it releases so much dopamine, even when it's educational, or just like a game that's like not exciting, it's still, the device itself just creates all this dopamine release, so, okay, so just, you know, this suggestion there. Yeah. And look at that, you. I like what Simmons said, you know, like, um, R. Simmons said, you know, that you're asking ahead of time for no electronics and most parents wish their kids were on screens less exactly right that's what i'm hearing you know as well and but you know i know it's a tough thing to to broach it it might not be something that's just a quick thing that you say it might be you know you try to ask you know but but first just hey what are you seeing or are you concerned or have you watched these programs and um i just read this book and wow it really just made me feel guilty i feel horrible you know and then they might go oh my god i feel bad too and Right, and it could just go right into it. I really, more and more, I'm finding parents are already coming into my office with limits, you know, on their on the young kids. So, it's just uh, the you know the the early Gen Z and late millennial kids that really got, you know, oh, they were experimented on, you know, with this whole, you know, a, a technology making it so addictive. So. Well, I will definitely share all those handouts with everyone and um, we'll put them in our TCS news for uh, next week because um, we'll it'll take us a minute to download the recording for this and um, Jim, we will definitely share your office's contact information also and um, really appreciate your time today and thank you yeah. everyone. Um, if you have any specific questions for Jim, um, I'll be sure in the email to put his contact info and um, we just appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. It'll be Dana at totallifecouncil.com. If you have any, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. All right, All right guys. guys. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much.
All right. See you, Alyssa. All Bye, right. Everybody. Take care, Jim. Thanks again. Let's get lunch soon. It would be I nice. I know. Though. I know. Maybe over the summer. May is not. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yes. With all the kids, that would be fun. Yes. We got to do that. We, we're building our pool. So hopefully. Oh, that's we're exciting. Hoping, we're hoping it's done this summer. <laughs> well, I've seen your boat pictures. The kids look oh. like they're having a great time with all that. Yes. We got to do that. We can do the boat. That's true. If the pool's not ready. <laughs> all, right, all right. Good. Well, I'm going to sign off. Bye, guys. Bye, Lisa.